Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar of the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and welcome to Living Divine Mercy here on EWTN. You know, many of you know that Jesus told St. Faustina that the Chaplet of Divine Mercy is one of the most powerful prayers that we can make. But what many don't know is the reason why Jesus gave her that prayer in the first place. Well, it's connected with the topic of our show tonight. As you may know, the March for Life in Washington, D.C. will be held this Friday as a reminder of the January 22nd anniversary of Roe v. Wade, the 1973 court ruling that legalized abortion in the United States. Since then, and even since the earliest centuries, the church has been staunchly pro-life. Why? Well, it's because it's about one of the most basic human rights, the right to life. And the one the church calls non-negotiable. Remember, the devil hates God's mercy more than anything else because mercy is behind the creation of man. And man is the crown of God's creation as we are made in his image and likeness, sharing even in his divine nature. But because Christ now resurrected and defeated death, the devil can't harm him. So he attacks those associated with him. And the main way he does this is to get us to take life through such tragedies as suicide, euthanasia, and especially abortion. You know, if we think that this is only a political issue and shouldn't be discussed in churches, we might want to hear what St. Faustina has to say about this. As we will hear coming up in Diary Gems, Paragraph 1276 talks about serious pains that St. Faustina had for three hours one night in her abdomen. The pains even caused her to lose consciousness. Now, Jesus had her realize that in this way, she took part in his agony in the garden and that he himself allowed these sufferings, saying that they were in order to offer reparation to God for the souls murdered in the wombs of mothers. Now, St. Faustina, so she didn't know if she would ever again suffer in this way, so she said that she would accept her sufferings with love. She said, quote, if only I could save even one soul from murder by the means of these sufferings. Then, in Diary 39, Faustina adds to this by saying, quote, One day Jesus told me that he would cause a chastisement to fall upon the most beautiful city in our country. I saw the great wrath of God, and a shudder pierced my heart. I prayed in silence. After a moment, Jesus said to me, my child, unite yourself closely to me during the sacrifice and offer my blood and my wounds to my Father in expiation for the sins of that city. Now, with regard to this incident, Sister Faustina's confessor, Blessed Michael Sapochko, gave sworn testimony during her beatification process, saying that he actually asked Faustina what this prophecy meant and why God was going to destroy that city. She replied the reason was on account of, quote, the crimes committed there, especially on account of the massacre of infants not yet born as the most grievous crime of all, end quote. You know, she told him that the city was Warsaw in Poland, which was a prominent center for providing abortions at the time. And abortion procedures were usually performed there between 8 p.m. and 11 p.m., ironically, the exact time that Faustina said she felt those abdominal pains. Now, if we read further, we see that the chaplet of divine mercy may have actually been given to stop this. Yes, yeah, St. Faustina in September of 1935 said, quote, When I saw the sign of divine wrath which was about to strike the earth, and in particular that certain place, I began to implore the angel to hold off for a few moments, and the world would do penance. But my plea was a mere nothing in the face of the divine anger. 
Just then, I saw the Most Holy Trinity. At that very moment, I felt in my soul the power of Jesus' grace, which dwells in my soul. When I became conscious of this grace, I was instantly snatched up before the throne of God. I found myself pleading with God for the world with words I heard interiorly. As I was praying in this manner, I saw the angel's helplessness. He could not carry out the just punishment, which was rightly due for sins. Never before had I prayed with such inner power as I did then. The next morning, when I entered chapel, I heard these words interiorly. Every time you enter the chapel, immediately recite the prayer which I taught you yesterday. You know, these words that she's talking about, this prayer, were the chaplet of divine mercy. The words, Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and the sins of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. So, in light of the testimony of St. Faustina and her confessor, it seems that this prayer was revealed particularly to counteract the sin of abortion. You know, knowing how much the evil one hates human life, which is in the image and likeness of God, as we said, this makes sense. So let us pray the chaplet of divine mercy for the protection of all life. You know, the right to life is the foundational right, the first right, before all other rights. And unless that human right is protected and respected by society, no other rights are secure. And we see them now suddenly disappearing. You know, as we said, January 22nd marks the 49th anniversary of Roe v. Wade, with more than 62 million abortions performed in the United States since 1973, and almost a billion and a half lives taken worldwide during that same time. In fact, globally, 25% of all pregnancies end in abortion. Now, we don't condemn anyone, including those who have been party to an abortion, and we need to support these mothers. We continue to pray for them and beg God's mercy upon them and ourselves because we are all sinners. And while we do judge these actions, true, we never judge the person. That is God's job. Now, we always need to keep in mind that no sin is outside the mercy of God. All sins, even abortion, are forgivable as long as we simply ask for God's mercy, such as by going to confession. You know, God is waiting with open arms to embrace you and to forgive you. God knows what you went through, and he is the best person to help you if you let him. You know, we humans, we never are able to fathom the trauma that abortions can afflict upon people or upon society. The United States Conference of Catholic Bishops said it this way, quote, The threat of abortion remains our preeminent priority because it directly attacks life itself, because it takes place within the sanctuary of the family, and because of the number of lives destroyed, end quote. But there is good news here. As there are many faithful souls praying and sacrificing for this cause, and because of that, God is still giving us a chance to change our ways. So we need to continue to pray and offer sacrifices for our country, no matter where we live, just as St. Faustina did. You know, we need to pray that hearts and minds will be changed and all abortion will come to an end. The culture of death will only be turned back by women led by the Blessed Mother and with men serving them as Christ serves Mother Church. You know, we must always remember that pro-choice advocates and these mothers are not the enemy. Satan is the enemy who wants to destroy all of us by trusting in God's mercy. However, we can prevent this. We need to treat everyone, especially these mothers, with dignity and respect because that is what being pro-life is all about. 
Now, speaking of motherhood, let's hear the story of a good friend of our Marian community named Dina Pasillo. Her inspirational story of healing is one that now helps many people through her teaching of divine mercy. I'm a wife and a mother first. I'm married to a wonderful man named Brian. Um, we've been married for almost 22 years. I have a daughter that we adopted. She's 18 now, and I have a stepson who is 41. Dina Pasillo grew up in a traditional family. You know, my parents are still married after 50-something years, and I have three brothers. We all, you know, worked very hard our whole lives, but we really didn't have faith as a priority within our family home. So it's been, it's been a journey for me, and Divine Mercy has played a huge role in where I am now and what I've experienced. But in her early 20s, a family friend betrayed her trust and radically changed her young life. I trusted him, and over the course of a few months, years, it actually it ended up being a total of seven years of my life that um, he abused me, you know, in kind of every sense of the word. And eventually I got pregnant. And um, I looked at it as, I didn't really know that there was a baby already. I mean, it was the early 1990s. And it, it was so early in the stage that when I went to Planned Parenthood, they told me that it was, they called it a clump of cells. They called it a fetus. And at that point, I didn't know. At the age of 22, Dina made the unfortunate decision to have an abortion. I look back now and, God, I wish I could turn back time, but I can't. But um, it was really, it was hard when I came to the realization of what I've done. But at that point in my life, I just did what I was told. And eventually, the Blessed Mother helped me to peel away I mean, like all those lies of deceit. And I started to see this person for what he was and kind of signs and clues as to everything was wrong and it felt wrong but I was in so deep I had no idea how I was going to get out. But she did get out with the help, the love, and the faith of a good man. And he doesn't even really realize how much he helped me but he helped me to, to push that person out of my life and he kind of saved me. You know that was my first saving. I still didn't have faith in my life. I mean I would go to church with my husband on Sundays, but I wouldn't even know what was going on at the Mass. I knew that I felt something. When the choir would sing, my legs would tremble. I would feel emotion and I would start to tear up. And I know now that it was the Holy Spirit trying to awaken my heart, you know, trying to, to break me away from the hardness and everything that I had bottled up so much and so deep. As Dina's desire to know her faith grew, so did her desire for a child. Unable to conceive, she prayed a novena to our Blessed Mother, asking that she too would know the joy of motherhood. I started that novena and I prayed it with heart and I remember being on my knees and talking to the Blessed Mother and to Jesus and I remember saying, just lead me down whatever path you want to lead me down. I will follow, I promise. I won't look back, I won't question anything, I'll just, I'll follow you. I literally, I interiorly heard, and I remember the moment where I heard the question, could you love a child who was handicapped? And I said, I could. I could love someone else's child, and I could love a child that was handicapped. And the night that I finished that prayer, I got a phone call from my mother, and she had said that our Aunt Shirley had been in the hospital. She had a brain aneurysm. And that my cousin Jasmine, um, CPS was actually coming to their home and any family who wanted to come and help out to show up the next day. So that day, the day after I finished that novena, I brought her home. Um, turns out now she is diagnosed with autism, um, but she's an amazing kid. She's the strongest person that I know and the love of my life. Like, I, don't, I can't even imagine you know, loving anyone as much as I love her. I didn't even know I had that kind of love in me. Who would believe that serving on a Lenten mission at their parish could set Dina on a path to healing? My husband and I agreed to be the mission lead couple. And it was hard, you know, it was hard stepping out of my comfort zone. 
because I knew that at the end of the week we had to give a talk on commitment. And I didn't know what I would say. You know, I didn't want to talk about me. I've never shared my story with anyone or anything, especially, you know, as deep as I felt if I was going to be authentic that I needed to be. And this was right around the time that New York State had brought, had enacted the RHA Act, reading about other states, how they were gonna follow suit. And I remember reading about this, and I remember um, sending a, an email to Father Chris. I was appalled, I was just so infuriated, and I asked him to do something. I'm like, Father Chris, you need to do something. You're a Marian, you know, please help. And we had several conversations about it, and he had asked, you know, would you ever consider sharing your story? And I said, well, I'd have to pray on it. And I did, I went to adoration and I prayed hard on it. I prayed long and hard because that was the one thing I was never gonna share with anyone. And God was ready with an answer to her prayer one day during mass. And I received Holy Communion at mass and there was no music playing. And I heard music in my, my interior and I heard the song that has the words that says, I have come to share my story. We have come to break the bread. And I thought, okay, God, I will. But it was so hard. It was so hard. Dina did share her story with family and friends, and then through the graces of her devotion to our Blessed Mother and Divine Mercy, made her peace with God. I promised God that I would spend the rest of my life spreading the message and devotion of Divine Mercy, no matter what it took, because when I die, I want to stand before God and have him proud of me and not, not upset with me and asking me questions like, why didn't you tell this person about me? Why didn't you share what I shared with you? I've become so involved with several different ministries that mean so much to me because they all kind of, they fall into each other. It's not something that it's just one ministry and you're done. You know, you really need to be part of the pro-life movement. You need to be part of you know, praying at the bedside with the sick and the dying or praying for your loved ones. In addition to Dina's other ministries, she has recently become certified as a leader in the abortion recovery program called Surrendering the Secret. Isn't it amazing how God can bring a greater good out of a tragedy, even an abortion? You know, he has healed me and he has loved me so deeply. But I just want every person to know how deeply God loves and how if he can take somebody as broken as I was and to heal me and take away all my pain, that he can do it for you too. Well, thank you, Dina, and to all the great ladies in Buffalo, New York, who help us Marian Fathers spread this message of divine mercy. Now, let's hear about one of our special Marian priests who is at one of our parishes out in the Chicago area that really focuses on bringing that pro-life movement and the message of mercy to his parish. Well, what drew me to the priesthood was actually seeing some good priests in, in the parish life and in school. And I thought, maybe that could be for me. And I, I liked helping people. I, I knew that my, um, my faith was growing and I wanted to, to use that in my life. And I could see that more in college as well. And, uh, but I was still uh, hesitant because I thought, ah, you know, I still want to see if I can get married, have kids, have a family. And so I uh, eventually I had to uh, reconcile with that and have some courage and trust that God has the best uh, plan for me. So if God wants me to be a priest, and if that was his first calling for me, then actually I would not be more happy uh, being married and having kids. I would actually be most happy, most fulfilled if I was a priest, if that was God's calling for me. So when I thought about it in that way, a great sense of peace came over me and, and I knew it at that point. What drew me specifically to the Marians was, well, my devotion to Our Lady was growing, especially uh, in high school and in college. 
and uh, through different apparitions and, and I read some books on Medjugorje that really impacted me a lot. And so I knew if I was going to join the priesthood and religious life that it had to be or devoted to Our Lady. And then when I found that the Marians were the ones uh, that were uh, in charge of Divine Mercy because my devotion to Divine Mercy already started in high school. It was like that perfect combination when I found out that the Marians were also close to Pope John Paul II. I was a great, you know, he was a great hero of mine. And I just found out about this place called Franciscan University in Steubenville. And when I found out that they just got a place in Steubenville, I'm like, it's all coming together. And also I wanted a order and a group that wasn't considering, well, should we bathe the church in this area or not? I, I didn't want that. I wanted a group that they knew who they were and, and they loved being part of the church and, and priests and religious. And so that's why I joined the Marians. The pro-life cause has always been close to my heart and, and um, in, in God's mercy. So I was trained in seminary, uh, how to um, counsel women who have had abortion or, or men. And, and uh, so I've always been interested in spreading the pro-life uh, cause, but doing it in, in a merciful way. And other organizations have done a great job with that and, and done different memorials with that. But I always feel like I want to do something positive pro-life. And so when I mentioned this to the parishioners, the idea of, uh, of St. Gianna came up. I already had devotion to St. Gianna in seminary. The parishioners, the Knights of Columbus, others from the area were a great support to make that happen. So we wanted a, a place there in which people could um, pray uh, and so we have the rosary walk there. And also um, they can have a brick in memory of their loved one who's passed or a child or miscarriage. Or, and, and so we wanted to implement that as well. But also to, uh, for people to know that uh, saints are real and they lived among us and they live among us and we have their, their pictures, their videos, and it's possible f for them as well. And so especially for the family at the parish, I want the moms to, to, to see that. I wanted the dads to see that. I wanted the kids to see that example of a, of a, of a saint and whose family is still here today. So that's, yeah, that's why we have that shrine there. Now let's hear from Scripture of the importance of life, the greatest gift God gives us. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down, and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. God has loved you from the very moment of your conception. As the psalmist proclaims, for you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. In fact, he made you because he wanted you in the world. With your unique combination of personality traits, natural talents, and supernatural gifts. God has a purpose and a plan for your life, some special task or mission that only you are fully equipped to perform. As the Psalm says, in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Jesus says to Saint Faustina, I thought of you before I called you into being. Before I made the world, I loved you. My love will never change. God has loved each one of us into being and wants each one of us personally to experience and enjoy His love forever. That is our true identity. It is who we really are and who we are meant to be. Now let's hear from one of our other Marian priests who has a tremendous passion for the pro-life movement. Hi, I'm Father Alan Alexander with the Marians of the Immaculate Conception, and today I'm joining hundreds of thousands of people in Washington, D.C. for the March for Life. We come here today to promote a message of mercy, a mercy that says that God's love is here for you no matter what no matter what you've done. Even if you've had something to do with abortion, if you don't even know what abortion is, if you 
think that you support abortion, we're here for you because Jesus is a God of mercy. That was, that's what today is about. And what does the March for Life mean for me? The March for Life for me, it's a day to gather, to remember the unborn, to you know, connect with other people who have the same beliefs, who have the same uh, ideals and, and are fighting for the same cause, but it means nothing. Uh, if we don't make it more than a day, if we don't live the message of mercy every day, if we don't strive every day to treat every person with the dignity and respect that they deserve, then today means nothing. And uh, that's the message I think that we're bringing here today, that Jesus is merciful, but we have to ask for that mercy. At eight o'clock, I was seized with such violent pains that I had to go to bed at once. I was convulsed with pain for three hours, that is, until 11 o'clock at night. No medicine had any effect on me, and whatever I swallowed, I threw up. At times, the pains caused me to lose consciousness. Jesus had me realize that in this way, I took part in his agony in the garden and that he himself allowed these sufferings in order to offer reparation to God for the souls murdered in the wombs of mothers. If only I could save even one soul from murder by means of these sufferings. Well, thank you everybody again for joining us here on Living Divine Mercy, and please join us next week as we talk about what is the domestic church. In the meantime, please join our Marian family. You can become a Marian helper by simply visiting micprayers.org and it takes very little time, costs no money, but you can start sharing in a lot of graces. And may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.